This is the example 6.7-3 from the text Conceptual Dynamics. The problem statement reads, a 20,000 kilogram rocket is directed 20 degrees away from vertical with its thrust vector gimbaled one degree away from the longitudinal axis of the rocket. If the rocket is experiencing 300 kilonewtons of thrust at an altitude where the acceleration due to gravity is approximately 8 meters per second squared, Determine the acceleration of the mass center G and the angular acceleration alpha of the rocket. The rocket has a centroidal radius of gyration of 5 meters and the length L depicted is 10 meters. So as we read the problem, we try to understand what's happening. This picture helps. What we have is we have a rocket and it's tilted 20 degrees away from vertical and then it has a thrust from the rocket engine where the thrust vector is tilted one degree away from the longitudinal axis of the rocket. We also attempt to determine what information is given in the problem and what information it is we're trying to find. So we're told that the rocket has a mass of 20,000 kilograms We're given information about the direction some of the things are pointing. We're told that the rocket is experiencing 300 kilonewtons of thrust, where a kilonewton is 1,000 newtons. So we have 300,000 newtons. We're told that the acceleration due to gravity is approximately 8 meters per second squared. So the reason that it's not the typical 9.81 meters per second squared is because we're sufficiently far away from the surface of the Earth. And what we're asked to find is we're asked to determine the acceleration of the mass center and we're asked to find the angular acceleration alpha. So in general, when we have rigid bodies, if they're translating and rotating, each point on the rigid body will have a different acceleration. So we need to be particular about what point we're trying to find the acceleration of. Here we're trying to find the mass center G. We then are also told that the rocket has a centroidal radius of gyration of 5 meters. And what that does, in essence, is that helps us to find the mass moment of inertia. So in general, mass moment of inertia is the mass times the radius of gyration squared. And the way you can sort of think of the radius of gyration is it's sort of the average radius of, the, of where the mass is located. If we plug in numbers, the mass is 20,000 kilograms, the radius of gyration is 5 meters. We plug that into our calculator, it's 50,000. kilograms. So that pretty much gives us everything that we're trying to find and that we're given. The next step is then to draw a picture, which in these kinetic types of problems is to draw a free body diagram. So I'm going to go ahead and do that on the next slide. So here on the next slide, we've copied over the information we've been given and the information we're trying to find. Here's an outline of the rocket that we're analyzing. At this point, we want to draw our picture, which is going to be a free body diagram. We think about what forces are acting on the rocket. We have its weight, which we place as acting at the center of mass. It acts straight down. It's equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity. And then we have the thrust due to the rocket engine. And it's tilted one degree away from the longitudinal axis of the rocket. 
So in general, we're trying to find acceleration of the rocket and angular acceleration of the rocket. In these sorts of problems where we're using Newton's laws, uh, we basically have two equations that we can use, some of the forces and some of the moments. The sum of the forces can be broken down into components. Uh, since we're moving in a plane, we'll break it down into x and y. It's a vector equation. The moments equation is also a vector equation, but for this planar motion, you know, we're only can basically rotate about one axis. You know, we are either rotating counterclockwise or clockwise. You know, either positive k or negative k. So using those equations, we begin we sum of the forces in the x direction. We look at our free body diagram. The weight is straight down, so it's entirely in the y. It has no component in the x. The thrust vector, however, does have a component in the x direction. We can figure out what that component is by doing a little bit of geometry. So I'm going to redraw the thrust vector up here to show things a little bit better. So we know that the thrust vector is, is tilted one degree away from the longitudinal axis. And the longitudinal axis is 20 degrees away from vertical. So if we kind of take our thrust vector, break it down into an x component, and a y component, the longitudinal axis is 20 degrees away from the vertical. So this, you know, all the way to the longitudinal axis is 20 degrees. The thrust vector is tilted one degree towards the vertical. So this is then 19 degrees. And the hypotenuse of this right triangle is the total thrust. So looking at this picture, the x component is the side opposite the 19 degrees. So we say uh, we use sine, so it's t times the sine of 19 degrees, and it's in the positive x direction as we've defined it. So that is the only force in the x direction, and it equals the mass times the component of the acceleration in the x direction, where we're specifically talking about the component of of the acceleration of the mass center. So I'll just state that real quickly, but in general, you know, when we do these sum of the forces equations, it's equal to the mass times the acceleration of the center of mass when we're dealing with rigid bodies. We then go ahead and do sum of the forces in the y direction. So here we have weight which is in the negative y. We also have a component of the thrust pointing in the positive y. So in this picture, we can see that the y component of the thrust is the side of the right triangle adjacent to 19 degrees. So we use cosine. So we have t, y, and the positive y minus the weight in the, because it's in the negative y, ty is equal to t times cosine of 19 degrees. The weight is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. And again, it's equal to mass times acceleration, where specifically um, we have the acceleration of the center of mass in the y direction. So here, we basically have everything we need to solve for, for the acceleration. So if I solve for the x component, I have t times sine of 19 degrees divided by the mass. That's 300,000 newtons times sine of 19 degrees divided by 20,000 kilograms. If I punch that into my calculator, that works out to be approximately 4.88. A newton 
is a kilogram meter per second squared. So the kilograms cancel. We're just left with meters per second squared. We can do the same thing for the y component of the acceleration. So on the left hand side, we have t cosine 19 degrees minus mg divided by the mass. Have 300,000 newtons times cosine of 19 degrees minus the mass, which is 20,000 kilograms, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, which in this case is 8 meters per second squared because we're so far above the surface of the Earth. We divide through by the mass. We punch that into our calculators. It works out to be 6.18 meters per second squared. You know, again, the kilograms cancel. We're left with just meters per second squared. So in total, if you want to write that, total acceleration has a component 4.88 in the i direction, 6.18 in the j direction, units of meters per second squared. That gives us one of the things we're trying to find. The other quantity we're trying to find is the angular acceleration. And that we can find uh, using the sum of the moments equation. In general, when we apply some of the moments, we can sum the moments about you know, different points on the body. In this case, a good choice is to, is to use the center of mass. We'll say the sum of the moments about the mass center to the mass moment of inertia about the mass center times alpha. And so, um, in general, using the mass center uh, gives us a relatively simple equation. And it also allows us to disregard the moment due to the weight. Because the, the weight passes through the center of mass, and so it has a moment arm of zero. So it imparts no moment. Okay, so if we look at this, our Our thrust is going to impart a moment. So the moment will be the thrust times the moment arm. I'll write the moment arm that way. Right now, it's imparting. We can see that it's an imparting a moment clockwise. That's going to be equal to the mass moment of inertia times alpha. We calculated the mass moment of inertia on the previous slide, so we, so we already know that. We know what the thrust is, what the force of the thrust is, so the only thing we need to determine is the moment arm. And so the way that we do that, if you recall, is we look at the line of action of the force. So I'm sort of exaggerating um, that angle a little bit. But we have the thrust acting along this line, and then we look at the perpendicular distance from that line of action to the, to the reference point, which is the CG. So here, then, is the moment arm. It's the perpendicular distance from the line of action to the, to the C center of mass. And we can calculate what that distance is by considering kind of a right triangle. We have a right triangle where the hypotenuse of the right triangle is the length L defined in the previous slide. And this angle is the angle that the thrust is tilted away from the longitudinal axis. So this is one degree.
So coming back here, we have our thrust, the moment arm is this distance where since it's the side opposite the angle one degree, we'll use sine, so it's the hypotenuse, times the sine of the angle equals the mass moment of inertia times alpha. We want to solve for alpha. We have what we had on the left hand side. We divide through by the mass moment of inertia. We plug in our numbers. So our thrust is 300,000 newtons. Length L is 10 meters. Sine of 1 degree. The mass moment of inertia is 50,000 kilogram meters squared. We plug that those numbers into our calculator. The angular acceleration works out to be about 0 0.105 the meters squared. Newtons is a kilogram meter per second squared, so the kilograms cancel. The other ma ma the other meter cancels, and so we're just left with sec you know one over second squared, where it's implied that we have radians per second squared. And by looking at the direction of the moment imparted by the thrust, we can see that it's clockwise. So that brings us to the conclusion of this problem.